I'm Dr. Bill Kelly, and I'm also one of the specialists here at HealthScan Imaging. One of the doctors you might sit and chat with after you've had a body scan here. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about your second most important position, your health. But a lot of you might look puzzled as if to say, gosh, what could be more important than my health? But you know what? If you're a parent, I think you've already got it because the health of your child is always your number one priority. But hey, being number two in your lifetime list of priorities is way up there. You know, as young adults, we get distracted with the business of life, right? I mean, getting educated, taking your first job, advancing your career, and remember, taking care of priority number one. It's easy to take your most treasured possession, your health, and treat it like a pot of oatmeal on the back burner. If you don't watch it, it could boil over and you could lose it. Now I'm going to give you some ideas on how to prevent your pot of oatmeal from boiling over. But first I want to look at health in a different way. Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, once said, attention to health is life's greatest burden. But you know what? Plato got it wrong. What Plato should have said was something like obligatory awareness of pain and disability from illness is life's greatest burden. Because the truth is, attention to health yields life's greatest benefits. Now in a few minutes, I'm going to share with you some facts and ideas that will help you nurture and protect your health extend your longevity, and improve happiness. Isn't that what we all want? You know, the ancient Greek philosophers, people like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, weren't always right. In fact, they were kind of like modern day rappers. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. They went by one name. They'd like to spat out smart sayings, aphorisms, rhyming them if they could. And pretty much nobody listened to what they had to say until after they died or got killed, right? But listen, I'm not done with the Greeks just yet. I want to point out it was Plato who first uttered the familiar phrase, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Now, you would have thought that was like Will Rogers or someone 100 years ago, but you know, it was Plato 2,500 years ago. And what did Plato mean by, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Two things. Number one, if someone offers you something free, shut up and take it. But number two, Plato was trying to convey the clever trick that you could quickly assess the general health of a horse by looking in its mouth. And what exactly would you look for? Well, um, things like gum recession, hence the phrase long of tooth, get it, old, stained teeth, missing teeth, bad breath, halitosis. By the way, that's one of the four H's of aging. Hair loss, halitosis, hernias, and hemorrhoids. But hey, we won't go there. Let's, let's get back on track. Now, well, actually, if I wanted to, I could uh, curl my lip up or show you some hernia scars and tell you what I'm talking about. But listen, I want to suggest to you that getting a body scan here at Health Scan Imaging is a great starting point to reassess your health and give you some guideposts going forward how you can advance and improve your longevity and health. So remember, at HealthScan Imaging, we can do better than looking you in the mouth. By the way, it's not free, but don't worry, it's affordable. And the results will help you deal with the most ponderous questions of adult life. You know, if you're between the ages of 40 and 60, and certainly older, you've already, I'm sure, had sort of an epiphany about the meaning of life and the anxiety about sickness and illness and maybe premature death. And by epiphany, I mean a sudden intuitive realization and appreciation of the fragility of health and the brevity of life, and probably a realization that came suddenly, maybe with the death of a loved one, 
or the illness of a close friend. And at the mid-century point in your life, it causes you to stay, take stock and ask yourself, what am I going to get sick from? What will I die from? And you want answers to those questions because you want to know if there's something you can do about it to preserve the life you're living and you love so much. So I'm going to give you some information that's a good starting point. And it's basically a review of what are Americans at risk from for premature death and illness. And I'm going to put it in context of what are the causes of death throughout the decades of life. Let me tell you first off that in the first 40 years, the first four decades, the most common cause of death is accidental death. Now it varies from when you're a baby, it's sudden infant death syndrome, then things like drowning in a pool, bicycle accidents, car accidents in America, over 35,000 deaths a year, industrial accidents. It's not until really after age 40 that cancer for a while is the number one cause of death. By the way, cancer eventually kills 24% of all Americans, but 42% of us get cancer. And that discrepancy means that some cancers can be dealt with successfully and you go on to live another battle. We all know people who've had, who've survived one, two, maybe even three cancers. But let's go back to the first years and look at the second leading cause of death. Now in the first five years it's the consequences of congenital malformations. Then about age 5 to 18, it's cancer. Yes, if you think about it, you'll remember pediatric hospitals always have an emphasis on cancer. Fortunately, that subsides into the 20s. But in the 20s, kind of a sad secret in America, your second biggest risk for death is homicide, being killed by someone. And then in the 30s, there's another sad secret. Suicide is the second leading cause of death. Um, and then let's move forward from the 40s. So you have cancer for a while as number one, but eventually heart disease is the number one cause of death, and it stays that way for the rest of life. Now, a lot of people think, oh, heart disease, oh yeah, I get that at age 70 in my family. Not true. Heart disease starts very early. Not like a pot of oatmeal, more like a pot of water on a stove, maybe tea. And uh, genetically, you got to deal with what your parents gave you. So think of it as the tea is on the stove and it's got a certain temperature you're born with. And then I want you to think about this. Add a couple clicks of fire for each of the major risks for heart disease. High cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. Those are the issues I want to talk about with heart disease. But first I'd like to also talk about how many people die of heart disease. Because heart disease is so dominant later in life, it kills half of us, half of all men, half of all women. And it is, in fact, the most common cause of sudden non-traumatic death, followed by pulmonary embolus, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, and a brain aneurysm. Those are the four causes of sudden death. Things we fear that could come on suddenly, like mm, crushing chest pain, Shortness of breath, weakness, you collapse and, you, and sadly you've got three or four minutes to think about life and half the time it's over. Same thing for a big pulmonary embolus, same thing for a ruptured aneurysm in your abdomen and a brain aneurysm, 3% of us have them. If it pops, thunderclap, blood shoots like out of a garden hose into your brain and 50% of the time you die suddenly. There are things we can do to look for these risks and deal with them proactively to push those risks aside and have better chances of living a longer life. Now, I'd like to go back to heart disease and emphasize what can we do about heart disease? You know, it's, I think, very important that I give you a basic understanding of the pathomechanics of heart disease. How does it start? Why does it start? How fast can it progress? And what can you do about it? And to get that, you've really got to learn about cholesterol. Um, but first, let's talk about the heart. Okay, here's a model of the heart, and we all know what the heart does. It's in here, it pumps blood, contracting once a second for your entire life. So it's real important. Now, how does the heart do that? Well, the muscle in the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber, it's thick muscle. 
and it needs its own blood supply. Where does it come from? Well, when the blood gets pumped out of the left ventricle, it goes up into the aorta. And there's big vessels that go to your brain and your arms, and it goes down through your body to your extremities. But before it goes anywhere, two vessels, the left and right coronary arteries, come off, and they branch, and they go to the heart muscle. And they branch like the roots of a tree, smaller and smaller and smaller, and they feed the heart muscle. Now those vessels are vulnerable to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis from cholesterol. This is a crowded artery model, but imagine this is a coronary artery. Um, if you look up close, you can see the yellow cholesterol plaques building up, and they do narrow the blood vessel. But what eventually happens, an unstable plaque, the intima ruptures, it pops again like a pimple, and it discharges debris downstream. Now, this illustration is uh, from our body scan brochure. It's also on the internet. And you can see what really happens. There's a big plaque, say in a coronary artery. It ruptures. The debris goes downstream. And it blocks the blood supply to a major portion of the heart muscle. That's called a heart attack. Now, it used to be thought that atherosclerosis was something like uh, mineral deposits in a plumbing system. It got narrower and narrower. And at some point, like a garden hose, it got narrowed to the point where boop, it stopped the blood flow. But that was wrong. What really happens is something different. Cholesterol, by the way, what is cholesterol? It is an animal food product. It only comes from things that come from animals. Therefore, your cholesterol goes up if you're a meat eater or you eat things that come from animals. Now, what does cholesterol look like? It's a waxy, fatty substance that comes from the familiar food pyramid we all worked with as children. Here are the bad boys. Oh man, some of you are thinking, oh Dr. Kelly, could you please grill up that filet mignon? Or, hey, I don't want 1%, I want whole milk. Look at that, would you like an omelet? Or a little salt maybe? Um, and here's some cheddar cheese. Now, I want to do a little game with you. In your mind, organize these, rank them in terms of which one has the most cholesterol per serving. You're going to be a little bit surprised. I'll give you the answers right now. Whole milk, and this is low-fat milk, is the lowest. About, whole milk is about 60 milligrams of cholesterol per 8-ounce serving. Now, what is whole milk? Whole milk has 4% butter fat. I want to give you a little tip when you shop. When you go to the grocery store and you see, oh, low-fat, 1%, that's got to be good. They took 99% of something out of there. No, they didn't. They took three-fourths of it out, or 2% milk. They only took half of it out. So don't even go low-fat. Go non-fat. Get rid of the cholesterol. This is the lowest cholesterol content per serving of these four. Now, number two is the steak, and this is filet mignon. By the way, how bad is that? Um, let me show you. If I take my thumb and wipe the filet mignon, my thumb looks pretty greasy, right? So if I take, say, this piece of glass and I smear it on there, uh, yeah, we left a big streak on there. Let's call that a cholesterol streak. That's what's happening inside your blood vessels every time you consume too much cholesterol. Now let's get back to our um, ancient food pyramid. The real, the next worst item is the cheese. About 240 milligrams of cholesterol per 8 ounce serving. But the worst, somewhat surprisingly to many people, is the egg. Not really the egg, the egg yolk. All the cholesterol is in the egg yolk and it has 270 milligrams of cholesterol. Now what can you do about that? You can change your diet. Now this may not look as appetizing, and I'm not here to give you comprehensive dietary advice, but this is some good stuff. What I'd like you to do is concentrate on fruit, some apples, uh, grapefruit, and if you got to have an omelet, use egg whites. Here's some egg beaters, zero cholesterol. And protein, nuts have absolutely no cholesterol. So these are things that can reduce your cholesterol. How important is it to reduce your cholesterol? Think about it this way, and remember this. If you lower your cholesterol one point, say, it's, uh, say you, you get your cholesterol measured and it's 210, your total cholesterol, 
and I put you on a diet and you come back in four to six weeks and your cholesterol went down to 180, you've achieved a 30% 10-year reduction in fatal heart attack risk if you keep that up. So that's what I want you to do, maybe even before you have a body scan. People come in here for the body scan and I say, Mrs. Wilson, I want you to go to Walgreens, get your cholesterol measured, and then go vegan for six to eight weeks, and then get it measured again. And a lot of wonderful things happen. They come back, their cholesterol's down 30, 40 points. They find out they don't have to go on statins, the medication that's so expensive and so many people take and it causes side effects. You can avoid that. And the food isn't so bad. There's another silver lining. Many patients come back and they say, whoa, Dr. Kelly, look at me. I lost 15 pounds. They love it. But a lot of people get all wired when I tell them to go on a vegan diet for a while. I say, Dr. Kelly, I can't do that because uh, I'm explaining it to them. Uh, you must uh, eliminate fatty foods, all animal food products, and you must reduce your portions and stop eating when you're full. What? Dr. Kelly, I can't stop eating when I'm full. When do you stop eating? And they say something like, when I hate myself. Okay. The key here is get all the stuff out of the refrigerator and about two or three nights a week go very light after sundown and stick with it. Because you know what? When people think about losing weight, they do it for the wrong reason. Look at me. I'm from a family of uh, people who struggle with their weight. I've had a couple siblings who've had uh, stomach bypass procedures. And I have a theory. People want to lose weight for the wrong reason. They want to look good. They want to look sexy. That's actually the wrong reason. You got to get your head in the right place. You want to add 10, 20 years to your life. You want to avoid premature joint failure. You want to avoid diabetes. Um, there's a lot of benefits to losing weight. Your joint health, avoiding osteoarthritis, it's so important. Now, why do I want to lose weight and keep my weight down? Number one, I want to look credible because I'm talking to you. I'm giving medical advice, right? I'm also, um, you may not be able to see this, I'm six foot five. I got a shop at Rochester Big and Tall. If I gain two inches in my belt, I got to spend a whole lot of money buying new clothes. And I want to look like I belong with my fiance. And I want to live long. But one of the subordinate reasons is I don't put at the pinnacle of my priorities what I look like. Do it for your health. Now, let's get, I want to go on a sidetrack a little bit about weight and what an important benefit you achieve through proper diet, uh, the indirect effect of losing weight and alleviating stress in your joints. I didn't tell you this, but I've had uh, two knee surgeries and I can, I can feel 10 pounds, boom, like that. And, you know, it's not cancer, but it's very annoying to be unnecessarily aware of a joint that hurts. Getting out of bed, twisting the wrong way, running, hiking over rugged terrain. You can greatly reduce the stress on your joints by losing weight. And when I tell people this and they don't believe me, I have an idea for them and I'm going to give it to you right now. It's a test to impress you with the benefits of losing weight for your joints. I tell people to go home on a Friday night and take your kids or maybe your grandson's backpack and load it up with 20, 30 pounds of flour. You know, I used to say sugar, but um, don't go there. You get ants, um, which reminds me of a great story about ants. Um, I have two stories really, but I'm just going to share one. Um, Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, was once given a lecture and there was a QA session at the end and some admirer in the audience said, Mr. Schultz, and he got chosen for the question. And the question was, Mr. Schultz, why are you willing to pay such a high price rent for those ground floor corner properties in downtown areas? And Mr. Schultz's response was, you got to sprinkle your sugar along the path of the ants. Don't make them turn. <laughs> and let me tell you about gyms. There's a gender difference in how people um, use and respond to gyms. Go to Gold's Gym, LA Workout, wherever, and you'll see there's a difference between men and women. What do I mean by that? Well, the men are typically 
in their early 20s. They're there because they finish high school or college, they've gained 20 pounds. And what do they do? They pump it up and they do maximum bench presses until they snap a tendon, they're out of there. The women, they're smarter. The women, maybe a little bit older, a few cougars in there, whatever, but they cross train. They do a little treadmill, they do a little stair step, they do light weights and they last longer. But then when the gym visits over, the men and women make similar mistakes. The men go to Burger King and load up 3,000 calories. The women go home in little groups and watch reruns of Sex in the City, drink red wine, have chocolate and some haagen -Dazs. You gotta stop that. You gotta be willing to subject yourself to the vigor and thrill of exercise and then go home and don't eat. At least try that two or three nights a week. It'll be one of the best things that ever happened to you. Okay, so enough about ants and sugar and metaphors for love. I want you to take a backpack you got from your grandkid, right? Put your 20 pounds of flour in it, zip it up, and on a Friday night, put it on. Wear it all weekend. And don't take it off till Sunday night, and then walk around. You'll feel like you're walking on air. Think of the pressure you've alleviated off your joints. Think of how good you will feel if you lose that much weight. Try it, it'll convince you. Now, if you succeed with my diet and exercise advice, for sure your joints are gonna feel better too. And let me show you exactly why. Let's look at a model of the knee. Okay, here, this is the top. This is the uh, thigh bone, quadriceps muscles come to a tendon, the kneecap, patellar tendon, tibia, the shin bone, and little fibula bone back here. So inside the knee, what do you get? At the ends of bones, particularly the weight-bearing joints, the bone is capped by cartilage, called articular cartilage, or hyaline cartilage, and it's, it's real smooth. And it's kind of like w when one opposes the other, it's like melting ice on melting ice. Now, God gave us cartilage that's about 7, 8 millimeters thick when you're a teenager, and you know what? That's all you get. It doesn't regenerate. And you wear it like tire tread. Think about that tire tread. Now imagine, um, here's your set of tires you get. Think of this as the cartilage on your joints. And everyone's issued a good truck in great condition, zero mileage, and you start putting miles on it. Um, what happens to that truck? Well, it needs gas, it needs oil, and you need shock absorbers, you need to replace them once in a while, and you need to balance the tires and rotate the tires. Because what happens if you don't, if you carry too much weight, imagine, in your truck, you have too much cargo, belly fat, and you're carrying that around, and you don't need it there. What happens to your tires? They go bald real quick, and that's what happens to your joints. You know, when you lose that articular cartilage, it hurts. That's arthritis. You get little spurs on the edges, and you can avoid that pain by keeping your weight where it should be your whole life. A couple other things about weight loss, it also affects spine degeneration. Now we look at a lot of these things on your body scan. We include the spine. Um, everyone knows what the spine looks like. Uh, the spine is about a block of vertebrae. You know, it goes from your neck, your skull base, all the way down to your tailbone. And in between each block of vertebrae, there's a shock absorber called a disc space. And those discs uh, provide some cushioning and they can, they can get disease. They can rupture from carrying too much weight, too much stress, but they tend to degenerate over time. They go from like a 20-year-old to 30-year-old to 50-year-old to a 70-year-old. Notice they've gone down in height, and you multiply that times a bunch of disc spaces. That's why you lose about two inches in height if you're over six feet between age 30 and say 70. And it could get worse if you have osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is thinning of the bones, loss of bone density, and this is something that women are more prone to because of the effects of hormones, particularly after menopause. It takes your bones from dense and thick to internally real thin. You know, a bone is kind of like um, a carpenter makes a roof. You have the trusses, the little sticks and struts that really provide the structural support, and the sheathing, the surface of the bone, would be the, the plywood underneath the shingles. But if you take those struts and make them real thin, the trusses, the bone gets so weak it can collapse and you get compression fractures. 
We measure your bone density here at Health Scan Imaging when you get a body scan, and we give you advice if your bone density is low on how to restore it and avoid the significant complications of osteoporosis. You know, when you get a, a fracture of your hip from osteoporosis, there's a 50% chance of dying within a year from complications from that event. So osteoporosis is one of those silent things that can lurk in the background and progress unbeknownst to you. You don't feel it. Maybe you look like it. You get a hook crooked over back. You lose a little height. Uh, you're typically thin. And has some similarities in terms of how it smolders in the background to atherosclerosis from um, high cholesterol levels. I want to give you a more focused perspective about cancer. You know, it's the sheer prevalence of cancer and its growth as a cause of death that should grab your attention. Currently, about a quarter of all Americans are dying of cancer. And part of the reason cancer has grown as a cause of death in the elderly before age 85 is because the occurrence of heart disease is actually being delayed and suppressed by education, successful lifestyle changes, and medical interventions. You know, this year, 1.5 million Americans will hear for the first time the words, I'm sorry, you've got cancer. That's one in 500 Americans. And this year, 600,000 Americans will die from cancer. Fully one-third of those 600,000 patients will die from the effects of tobacco use, mostly lung cancer. One-third will die from the effects of poor nutrition, inadequate exercise, and obesity. And the other third is a combination of uh, bad luck, unfortunate genetics, and simply random chromosomal misbehavior. I'd like to review now the top 10 causes of cancer death. Far in the lead at number one is lung cancer. Lung cancer kills 157,000 Americans last year. 95% of those deaths are attributable to smoking. So if you don't smoke and you haven't smoked in the last 10 years, you can pretty much forget about lung cancer. But remember this, if you do smoke and you stop, within 10 years, your risk of lung cancer pretty much subsides to the same level as someone who's never smoked. So remember, it's never too late to stop smoking. Also, remember the other benefits of smoking cessation. You arrest the progression of emphysema. You eliminate the nasty chronic cough you may have. You suppress the incidence of other types of cancer. You increase your oral hygiene, and you save money. You know, in the early 1900s, before mechanized mass production of cigarettes, to be sure, lung cancer was a pretty rare diagnosis. Doctors weren't even sure what they were dealing with. Now, 100 years later, fully one-third of men who die of cancer die of lung cancer, and one-fourth of women who die of cancer also die of lung cancer. And the occurrence of lethal lung cancer in women is actually, sadly, still increasing. Now, colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in both men and women. 51,000 Americans died last year from colon cancer. Now, after age 50, the American Cancer Society recommends that everyone gets screened for colon cancer every five to 10 years. And how do you get screened? You undergo a colonoscopy. And what do we look for? We look for little things called polyps. What is a polyp? Polyps are little fleshy ingrowths of tissue from the lining of a colon. Now, we're gonna show you a polyp that we detected here at Health Scan Imaging. When a polyp is only four to five millimeters, about the size of a pea, it has less than a 1% chance of having colon cancer within it. But when it's just a little bit bigger, uh, 20 millimeters, the size of the tip of my little finger, 
there's actually a 20% chance of it having colon cancer within it. Now, sadly, only 50% of adults over 50 undergo colon cancer screening. And I'll, I'm thinking most people watching this video know a relative or a friend who's died unnecessarily from colon cancer. And if you wait too long to get your colonoscopy and you're unfortunate enough to have a colon cancer, it may have already spread to the lymph nodes, to the liver, or other organs, and it may become incurable. Remember, colon cancer is actually slow growing and it can be detected. Don't become a needless victim of colon cancer. Breast cancer accounts for about 40,000 female deaths annually in the U.S. About 5% of uh, breast cancer deaths do occur in men. Now, um, breast cancer, by the way, gets much more attention and government funding for research than does lung cancer. And the reason for that is probably because uh, I think there's less sympathy sometimes for lung cancer because it's, it's a result of uh, indulgent behavior and accepting a risk that people do or should know about. Um, now breast cancer is something that um, can get out of control pretty quickly if women don't follow certain screening guidelines. You want to concentrate on regular breast self-examination, periodic physician examination of your breasts, and if you're over 40, especially if you have a maternal family history of breast cancer or if you've already had breast cancer, you want to be sure to have annual mammography and if necessary you want to combine that with ultrasound examination if you have dense breasts or family history probably MRI and occasionally ultrasound. Now if breast cancer is detected by virtue of a lump or a finding on your mammogram or uh, a suspicious lesion on the MRI there are things that can be done. Proper swift application of interventions such as lumpectomy, radiation therapy, chemotherapy can actually cure breast, breast cancers if they're detected early. So remember women, follow recommended guidelines for cancer care, especially uh, cancer screening for breast cancer if you're over 40. Now, um, pancreatic cancer is the uh, fourth leading cause of cancer death. Sadly, it's pretty common and that's a little bit scary. Pancreatic cancer kills 37,000 Americans per year and Sadly, it's one of the most lethal cancers. Even if it's detected early, it's often out of control because the, the pancreas is a very deep organ in the upper abdomen near the spine. It doesn't have a capsule. The early symptoms of pancreatic cancer, subtle, may just be weight loss, may be a general feeling of malaise. And by the time someone comes to attention, even though the tumor can be smaller than a walnut, it's already spread outside the capsule or it's in the liver and there's little that can be done. But we do know that there are things you can do with your lifestyle to diminish your pancreatic cancer risk. We do know, for instance, that pancreatic cancer occurs with increased frequency in smokers, people who consume alcohol excessively, those who have poor diet, those who have uh, obesity, and recurrent pancreatitis. So be mindful of the lifestyle risks for pancreatic cancer. Now, Prostate cancer is the fifth leading cause of cancer death. Really, prostate cancer is to men what breast cancer is to women. 32,000 American men will die of prostate cancer this year. But prostate cancer is pretty common and it occurs kind of on a sliding scale of aggressiveness, so much so that many men will die with prostate cancer rather than from prostate cancer. What's the key to detecting prostate cancer early? A couple things. Number one, you want to follow your PSA level. That's an antigen test, that, a blood test that you can have to help determine your prostate cancer risk. And if you're over 50, man, you want to get a periodic um, rectal exam so a physician can determine if you have a knowledge on your prostate and then if it's appropriate you have imaging, either ultrasound or sometimes MRI, to target a biopsy. Treatment for prostate cancer varies. It can be anything from radiation to surgery to chemotherapy. 
and sometimes if it's a low-grade tumor, watchful waiting may be the best choice. Now I'd like to round out um, the top 10 cancers and there are three that account for number six, seven, and eight, and they're the three L's, leukemia, lymphoma, and liver cancer. And they account for 22,000, 20,000, and about 18,000 deaths per year. Now the final two in the top 10 are ovarian cancer in women and esophageal cancer in both sexes. Each of them accounts for about 15,000 deaths per year. Ovarian cancer, how do we screen for that? Well, women over a certain age after menopause should probably have an occasional pelvic ultrasound examination to evaluate the ovaries if you still have them. You can also have a blood test called CA-125, but sometimes ovarian cancer is detected when it's too late. It's just something we have to be vigilant for. Esophageal cancer is kind of tricky. It, it occurs with increased frequency in people who have GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, you know, heartburn. It irritates the esophageal lining. Some people may have difficulty with swallowing, chest pain, weight loss, low blood count, anemia. The problem with esophageal cancer and a lot of other cancers is sometimes the symptoms are very nonspecific and they overlap with conditions that are non-cancerous and benign. So the key to a lot of cancers in order to avoid uh, uh, getting behind the eight ball and, and really finding it too late is to educate yourself and to retain the knowledge and add to the knowledge that I'm sharing with you now. I've given you, I'm sure, what you will regard as a lot of foreboding and perhaps intimidating information about cancer. But don't worry, even if you're over 50, if you're having a body scan today, there's actually only about a 2% chance that we will uncover something that requires prompt further attention, more imaging, and may lead to a significant diagnosis. But you have a much bigger chance of us finding trends in your body that would prompt us to recommend lifestyle changes so we can help ensure that you will have a longer and healthier life. Hey, congratulations, you've stuck with me all the way to the end. Listen, I know I've probably given you more information than you were prepared for, but you know what? I'd like to finish by giving you a quick summary of exactly what happens when you come to Health Skin Imaging for a body scan. It's simple. You call us and make an appointment. The day you arrive, you're taken to a changing room and put into a gown. You go into our CT scan room and you lie on the table on your back. No needles, no injections, you don't feel a thing. You simply hold your breath and in 20 seconds your scan is over. But our work has just begun. We use a sophisticated workstation to process, analyze, and review hundreds of images and we look at all your organs from the base of your neck to your pelvis. And when you come back to meet in a private consultation, we give you a CD that contains all the images and three separate narrative reports one for your body scan, one for your coronary artery calcium score that will give you an all-important roadmap that guides future cardiac health. We also give you a third report for osteoporosis, checking for your risk for that serious disease. Now, if you need it, we can add an MRA of the brain to look at the circular willis, the vessels at the base of the brain, checking for aneurysms. We can do an MRA of your carotid arteries in your neck, or we can add MRI of any body part, for instance, a joint that hurts. You know, I look forward to seeing you soon, and I hope you come to Health Scan Imaging for your body scan. Thank you.